here to join us from uh, the faculty department. Uh, quite accomplished, and we appreciate her coming to us and talking to us about suffering. And thank you for giving us uh, sustenance to. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, Dr. Weigel asked if I would give the annual or every other year sepsis lecture, and I told him, sure. And the next thing I know is I looked at the, the calendar, and I was like, uh, crap, that's this Friday. But that's okay, because Dick's not even in town. Poor Dr. Duhon and the uh, trauma team are downstairs doing a trauma stat right now, so hopefully they'll be back in a little while. But what I wanted to do was kind of go through sepsis. I know some of the slides some of you guys have seen before, some of this none of you have seen before. And I've added some things here and there to kind of update where we've been probably in the last two years since we've done this particular lecture. Now, one thing that I think is extremely important, especially working in an academic setting, is that a lot of times we throw young doctors out very, very early and say, go take care of this patient. And what happens is they get, to ex they get experience before they get really taught how to take care of some types of patients. So I thought it'd be better maybe today to present the lesson and therefore you'll know what to do when the patient rolls in. Now, today's objectives are pretty simple. We're gonna talk about how to diagnose sepsis, how to treat sepsis, and kind of go through the cascade going from a simple infection all the way through the shock-like state. Um, I'm not being sponsored by anybody, so if anybody wants to sponsor me, I'm good. I'll be glad to put your you know, name on my scrubs or something like that if you're good for it. I do work for the state of Louisiana, so hey, I'm up for anything right now when it comes to that. This particular quote I've always loved, I've always kept it on uh, this particular lecture, is from the father of modern medicine, Sir William Osler when he said there are in truth no specialties in medicine since to know fully many of the most important diseases a man must be familiar with their manifestations in many organs. And this to me is sepsis. You know, you have a patient, it doesn't matter what department, what type of patient it is, sepsis is sepsis across the board. Whether it comes from a post-op infection, whether it comes from a pneumonia, UTI, it doesn't matter. Sepsis is sepsis. It involves the entire body, and I think we all need to have to take care of that particular disease process as a group, not individually. Now, some of you have seen this slide before, and I like it because years past, when you mentioned this disease process, people just stared at you. Nobody had ever heard of it before, and nobody really cared. And the reason why nobody ever cared is because, you know, people like Farrah Fawcett that died from rectal carcinoma or things such as that, you know, you hear about, and they're famous, and everybody cares about those particular people. Superman. Pneumococcal pneumonia sepsis. Pope, pneumococcal pneumonia sepsis. Kermit the Frog died from pneumococcal pneumonia sepsis. So once we started seeing bigger names and people that are in the news, other people started thinking, well, what is this? Why do we care so much about it? And based on that, when we look at our patient, and like I said, sepsis is a total body system disease. And therefore, like I said, it crosses all departments, all types of patient care. And for that, when we look at this particular gentleman, although it is an older, pi older picture, because you, know, you can tell because it's got a PA catheter. Who, anybody in this room know what one of those are? Anybody's ever seen one of those, except for maybe Dr. Walter? <laughs> that we actually used to use this particular device to look at cardiac function in our shock patients, not just for right heart anymore. But you can tell he's got cardiogenic dysfunction. He's got respiratory dysfunction. He obviously has hematologic, he's got neurologic, he probably has renal because he's got edema. So it's a multi-organ disease process that we're taking care of. And when we look at it, it is a quote-unquote major cause of morbidity and mortality in the world, not just in the United States, but in the U.S. it is the leading cause of death in the non-coronary ICU. Across the board, overall, it has moved from the 11th to the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. When we look at the number of cases annually, it's more than three quarter of a million patients that we actually see. And we actually feel that that number is low from actuality because what we see is that those numbers are treated. It's not actual. So the numbers are probably significantly higher. And across the world, you're probably looking at about 19 million cases of severe sepsis a year. So it's a major one. When you look at mortality, overall mortality is about 30%. And it depends on where you practice as to where your actual mortality is. 
in, pa in places where they're very active, they're up to date, they see a lot of sepsis patients, you're going to be closer to 20%. Smaller institutions that don't see a lot of sepsis may see some sicker folks. You may be upwards of 30 to 40%. 30 years ago, the mortality from sepsis was 80%. Now we're down to 20 to 30. So we've really, really done a very good job. But we still have a significant problem because you're looking at upwards of 600 deaths per day from this particular disease process. Now, I told you that it's very common. It's actually more common than heart failure, cancer, or AIDS. But when you talk about research and you talk about research dollars, they don't go to sepsis. They go to heart disease. They go to cancer. But again, look at your mortality almost hits that for acute MI. And let's face it, how many times do patients actually die of cancer or do they die of AIDS? They die of complications of those disease processes and a lot of times the complication is actually severe sepsis. So when we look at the definition of this particular disease process, it goes all the way back to Hippocrates. And Hippocrates actually stated that sepsis is the process by which flesh rots, swamps generate foul airs, and wounds fester. That sounds like a disease I want to take care of. Galen said, it's a laudable event, necessary for wound healing, and Pasteur just described it as blood poisoning. Luckily for us, in 1992, some extremely intelligent people got together from ACCP and SCCM, and they said, let's actually take these six words, give them definitions, so that every single person can be on the same page. And I can remember back in the late 80s and early 90s where, you know, we didn't have a lot of stuff going on with smartphones back then. And we actually had things called mail. And we would get phone calls. And they would want to do surveys. And they would ask, doctor, do you have a few minutes? We'd like to ask you a couple questions. And they would ask, what is your definition of septicemia? What is your definition of bacteremia, et cetera? And they took all this information and these guys all got together, and they came up with these particular definitions for these six terms. Therefore, everybody was on the same page. When you said severe sepsis, everybody knew what that meant. You didn't have 3,000 different thought processes going on. Everybody knew what it meant. And in 2003, these two groups, plus the European Society of Critical Care, got together to review those definitions and see if they wanted to add or change anything. Well, I'm sure it was after about a very short meeting. They said, no, they seem to work for us. Let's go to the beach. So, but even in 2003, when they reviewed the definitions, they kept them. Now, from there, we have what's called a continuum of disease. And I know we, we like to throw out the word sepsis and severe sepsis and septic shock a lot. But what does it actually mean? Well, patients will present with an infectious process. So we're all familiar with infection, whether it be bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic. We're all very familiar with that. But then there's this concept called systemic inflammatory response, or SIRS. Now, in this particular category, there's four different processes that go on. The first is going to be alteration in temperature. You're either going to have hyperthermia or hypothermia. Keep in mind, hypothermia is worse. Those patients are sicker. And I can't tell you how many times I'll have a patient presented to me in the ED and the resident will go through everything, and they go, but I think they can go back to the nursing room, I think they can go home, and I go, well, what about that temperature of 95.6? And they're like, well, what about it? They're hypothermic. They're septic. And they're like, what? It's like, they're septic. They can't mount a fever response. Those folks are actually sicker. Then we look at heart rate. Well, for some reason, our guys back in 1992 didn't go to physiology class, but they decided that tachycardia was actually greater than 90, so if a heart rate is greater than 90, patients meet criteria for that criteria. Then we have respiratory. Initially, it was greater than 20 breaths per minute, but they've now included anybody that requires non-invasive or invasive mechanical ventilation or anybody that has a PaCO2 of 35 or less to meet that criteria. And then alterations in white blood cell count. Now, when you look at this particular definition or these particular criteria, these do not only occur in patients that are infected. They can occur in patients with burns, massive transfusions, trauma, pancreatitis. If I ask most of you to, to hit the stairs right now, run from the ground floor to the 10th floor back again, and come back in here, a lot of us would meet that criteria. Stairwells are not air conditioned, so our temperatures are going to go up. 
our heart rates will go up, our respiratory rate will go up, and we may even demarginate and have a bit of a white count. Does that mean we're septic? No, it just means that we have an inflammatory response. When we look at sepsis itself, you add two or more of the SERS criteria with a presumed or confirmed infection. Patients do not have to have positive cultures to be septic. You can assume somebody has a pneumonia, somebody has a UTI, somebody has a bowel infection, etc. Any of those things put together define sepsis. If you add organ dysfunction to it, you have severe sepsis. You add cardiovascular refractory shock requiring vasopressor support, that becomes septic shock. And when we look at our organ dysfunction, we look at organ dysfunction, man, which uh, Bob Balk published back in 2000. And we always think about the big three organs. We always think about cardiovascular, we think about respiratory, and we think about alterations in renal function. But we always forget about the other four. And it's very important to know how many organs are involved in your particular patient when you look at your septic situation. And the reason for that is because if you don't look at your liver functions, you can miss hepatic dysfunction. If you don't look at the patient's neurologic status, do they have a decreased G GCS, do they have an altered level of consciousness, you have neurologic impairment. But some that we don't think about quite so often, unless you do this all the time like we do, is hematologic. Are they in DIC? Are they thrombocytopenic? When I was sitting in the chairs that you guys are sitting in, we always said patients had sepsis or septic shock with or without DIC. DIC was its own little category out here. But what we've learned is DIC is actually part of hematologic dysfunction. It's an organ system to its own. And what's extremely important when you look at the platelet count is the lower the platelet count or the faster the drop in platelets, the more prognostic it is. If you've got a patient that comes in with 300,000 platelets and within 24 hours they drop to 150 or they drop to 100, that patient is a heck of a lot sicker and their outcome is a lot worse than the patient who goes from 300 to 290 or something like that. So it's the level of platelets and the rapidity with which they drop. And the seventh organ, which to me is probably the most important organ of all of them, is metabolic. What's their lactate? What's their perfusion? And the reason why it's important to know how many organs are down is because as you add organs, you increase mortality. It's as simple as that. When you calculate your organs, the more organs that are dysfunctional, the higher your mortality. And I've had several patients recently where you count them up and they're at six. Their mortality rate is close to 95%. And families need to know that going into this so they have a realistic outcome of what their loved one is facing at that particular point in time. Now, what's the pathophysiology behind this particular disease? And I know the next couple of slides are going to be very busy. They're going to be very difficult to read in the back. And they're, they're not placed here expecting everybody to be reading all the words on the slides. The reason why I put these particular slides in is there's always a couple of people, every time I give this lecture, hey, can I get a copy of your slides? Absolutely. I put it all in there for completeness so that everything is in there, so that if somebody wants a copy, I'll be glad to share it with them, and it's there for them to review it. But when you look at the pathophys related to severe sepsis, is you have several different areas. You have the host pathogen interaction, you have your pro-inflammatory response, and you have your anti-inflammatory response. And as you put all of those things together, you're going to be able to determine, is your patient going to be able to fight off this episode of sepsis, or are they going to end up going through the cascade and ending up in septic shock? So let's face it. You have patients that come in, they've got a horrible pneumonia. You take a look at that chest x-ray, that pneumonia is terrible. They're on eight liters of oxygen by nasal cannula, barely saturating, greater than 90 percent. Their white count is 30,000. They don't look that great. You put them in the hospital, you give them oxygen, you give them some antibiotics, you give them some fluid, and the next day, they're up, they're sitting up in bed, and they greet you, good morning, doctor, how are you today? You're like, whoa. And then you take the same exact patient, and within 12 hours, if it takes that long, they're in fulminant shock, they're in the ICU, and they're on three different vasopressors. Same disease process. Why does one patient do well and one patient not do well? Well, it's all related to how all of these factors play in together. Which one wins? 
do the pro-inflammatory response wins or does the anti-inflammatory response win? So putting that all together, it's extremely important. Now when you take a look at what all of those things cause, they cause two very important problems. The first is related to tissue hypoperfusion and the second is related to loss of barrier function. And again, if the body itself can fight off these particular issues, your patient who looks terrible on admission, but within 24, 48 hours, looks like they're ready to go home, versus that patient that comes in with the same disease process who may actually look good when they first come in, may be dead in 24 hours. It's all related to who wins, the yin or the yang, related to inflammatory cascade and the host factors. Now to simplify everything that we just saw on both of those slides, basically you have microvascular dysfunction where you're going to have an increase in inflammation, an increase in coagulation, and a decrease in fibrinolysis. That's going to lead to microvascular thrombosis and endothelial dysfunction causing hypoperfusion, and from there you're going to get tissue hypoxia of some sort. Now, I mentioned to you that sepsis is a disease that involves the entire body. So why is it that somebody that presents with a pneumonia or a UTI isn't limited? Why is it that all of a sudden you get multi-organ dysfunction from a simple UTI? You know, it involves a GU system. How is it that they're confused? How is it that their platelets don't work? And the rationale behind that is because it affects the microcirculation. And the microcirculation goes through the entire body, as I just showed you on those two rather busy slides that I'd be more than willing to share with. Now, we've taken all that information and we've got the definitions of sepsis, we've got the pathophysiology of sepsis, but for years we didn't have any consensus on how to treat sepsis. Everybody kind of did their own thing. Finally, like I said in 92, we got definitions that everybody agreed on, but we still didn't have an agreed upon method of treating the patients. And it really wasn't in 2000, until 2004 when the surviving sepsis campaign was initiated. And it was with that initiation that physicians got together, and trust me, I know a lot of these guys, and they're pretty smart. And as you can see, my name's not on there, so obviously it's smart people that got together to do this. And they came up with, after reviewing all the literature that they could find, basing it on evidence-based medicine, is how, bless you, is how are we supposed to treat these types of patients? What's the best way to do it? So they graded everything based on evidence-based medicine, and they presented it to us in the critical care arena. And what they looked at, this is the, what the first surviving sepsis campaign guidelines looked like. And they graded it A through E, A of course having the most solid evidence-based medicine, all the way to grade E, which was, well, we've got a couple case presentations over here that may work out okay on those two patients that we saw. And as you can see, a lot of the stuff looks familiar. And they took this information and they put it into the bundles that everybody is very familiar with. We had our six-hour bundle and we had our 24-hour bundle where those of us that were taking care of sepsis patients were recommended, because, I mean, we can't say required because it wasn't like somebody from the federal government was going to come down and arrest you if you didn't do it. But this was your six-hour bundle that they recommended that you check off and you do all of these things within the first six hours. And then you had your management bundle where they recommended all of these things be done within the first 24 hours. In so doing, we had a consensus on how to treat these particular patients, when we should do what, and how we should do it. In 2008, they reviewed everything that they had gotten from 2004. They surveyed physicians and nurses, nurse educators, that were taking care of these types of patients, utilizing these bundles, took in new literature that had come out since the 2004s were written, and adapted from there. And what they did at that particular point in time was gave us pages upon pages of information that would, quote unquote, help us to take care of these types of patients. And they either used a black and circle, which was a strong recommendation that they said was we recommend or an open circle, which indicated that something that might work, might not work, but we suggest it. So therefore, it all goes back to evidence-based medicine. And they broke it all down. Again, you had your initial six hours, just like 
on the previous bundles, you had your initial six hours, and they're still recommending resuscitating patients aggressively and utilizing some form of goal. But they weren't actually willing to sit down and say 100% whether or not we should or should be doing certain things. They were suggested. Again, diagnosis, antibiotic therapy, source control, all of those things, pretty solid on there. You know, fluid therapy, vasopressors, inotropes, steroids. Uh-oh, right here. Activated protein C. All of a sudden, activated protein C lost that dark circle, which was there in 2004. And in actuality, it fell off. And you can't even get activated protein C anymore. You can't get drugs alpha. Then a lot of other things came into play. They looked at, you know, blood product administration, types of mechanical ventilation, sedation, glucose control, renal replacement, bicarb, stress ulcer prophylaxis. All that kind of stuff came in. And they gave, we recommend or we suggest, and they took all of that that I just showed you and put it right back into the bundles. So if you look at your bundles, they look a lot familiar than they did in 2004, but if you go deeper into the article, it'll actually break this down further for you into recommend or suggest. One thing that I usually do at this particular point in time that I'm not going to do this year, just because there's just not enough time to do it all, and number two, a lot of you have heard this, is... Everything that's really on this side in the first six-hour bundle, really there's no controversy to it. Nobody's going to argue that you should obtain blood cultures. Nobody's going to argue that you should have source control, that you should adequately volume resuscitate your patient, and that you should use some form of endpoint for your resuscitation. Nobody's going to argue that. That's not very controversial. Everything that's over here in this particular bundle has a lot of controversy related to it. And that if you read the articles, some articles are pro, some are con, and you gotta go back and forth on it. I can tell you right now, although this is listed here, this is gone. You can't even get activated protein C. So that's not even controversial anymore. You can't even get it. But when you look at steroids, you look at glucose control, and you look at tidal volumes, I can tell you right now, if you look at the literature across the board, you have to be able to read the article itself and interpret the data. And I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I can tell you that most of these, as you can see, that's a 1C, that's a 2C, et cetera. You've got to look at it and decide for yourself. In our ICU, we use lower tidal volumes. We use tight glycemic control. We try to keep ours between 80 and 150. We do use steroids. We like to use somewhere between 50 Q6 or 200 over, tw over 24 hours. We do believe in steroids in our ICU, and I've got the data to back that up. But I don't want to spend this presentation going over the pros and cons articles. What I wanted to do was move forward with that and say, what did we do different from 2008 to 2012, and where are we right now with what we're actually doing, and present some different stuff to you from that account. If you actually look at 2012s, they kind of looked at the diagnoses of these and kind of expanded them for you. I found this kind of cool, and that nobody will put this in the bundle, but in the 2012 guidelines, you can start looking at Procal's. We use Procalcitonin all the time, don't we guys? I mean, you're probably, you're probably sick of it. We lectured yesterday, I told them, if you draw blood cultures on a patient, get a Procal with it. So we use those all the time. You're starting to see different hemodynamics and all the stuff related to tissue perfusion. You see a lot of stuff about lactate. Your definition, is a little bit different here so for your sepsis. You start looking at organ dysfunction, like we talked about, but we don't have the little cute little man to look at anymore from that standpoint. And when we looked at our diagnostic criteria, Angus and their group in 2013 said, I want to publish an article that says exactly the same thing as the one from 2012 did, but I want my name on it. So basically, Angus and their group, because they're out of Pittsburgh, they decided to rewrite everything exactly the way it said in 2012 guidelines. But they went ahead and wrote their recommendations again. Initial resuscitation, screening for sepsis, diagnosis, antimicrobials, all that stuff that we've been doing, source control, infection prevention. And they broke it down between three hours and six hours per se. But it's everything that we've been doing. It's the same bundles, the same stuff we've been doing for years from that particular standpoint. Here's a question. Fluid therapy, crystalloids versus colloids. Decide for yourselves. I'm not getting into that one. Vasopressors, which vasopressor should we use? You know, norepinephrine is the answer. Epinephrine is your second. 
vasopressin should be used as a replacement. And I've got all the studies to back that up if anybody's got any questions. Inotropic therapy, that comes really big into questions. Should we use inotropes? If we should, when should we use them? How high? What dosage? What drug? You know, and the recommendations is usually dobutamine up to 20 micrograms. Well, that's great. What if your patient's tachycardic? Dobutamine's not a best choice. You may want to use milrinone. It's a possibility. And everybody forgets my favorite, Inacor. I love Inacor. It's yellow. You know, everybody needs a little color hanging from their IVACs from now and then. I used Inacor all the time growing up in my septic patients. And it worked fabulously. But it's nowhere in here. Corticosteroids, like I said, depends on what you read. The studies will show you that you may not see a change in survivability, in mortality, utilizing steroids. But you've got to look at the articles closely. Because what you see is that the studies that showed increased survival actually were patients that were in fulminant septic shock on vasopressors and were randomized and treated within eight hours. The ones that didn't show a difference in survival were severe sepsis, some of them not on vasopressors, and they were 24 hours out. But all of them showed reversal of shock faster with steroids than not steroids. So there's, there's something right there. Blood products, we're going to talk about that later. IVIG, no, don't bother. IV selenium, no, don't bother. You know, like I said, activated protein C, it's gone, you can't get it. Mechanical ventilation, again, when you look at the Arginet protocol, adapting it to what we're doing today. Sedation, we've totally changed what we do with sedation. We don't paralyze people anymore. Man, when I was a, when I was a resident and a fellow, if a patient was able to flick a toe, they were under sedated. Under sedated. They needed more neuromuscular blockade. Nowadays, we want patients with rashes of zero. We want them interactive with us as much as possible to help them get better faster, moving around, PTOT. Nothing's cooler than watching your patient with the ventilator walking up and down the hallway, right? You, you want them lightly sedated. You want them moving. Glucose control, renal replacement therapy. How many times do we see CRT in our septic patients? All the time. The reason why is because it works. If you look at the data, if you look at the literature, there's no difference in outcome between intermittent and continuous. However, in your hemodynamically unstable patients, there is a difference in your outcome. Read the articles closely. Bicarbonate? No, don't push bicarb on most of these people. There's no reason for it. DVT prophylaxis, stress ulcer. Nutrition, feed your patients. Just because somebody is on levofed does not mean they cannot be fed. As a matter of fact, they'll get into more trouble if you don't feed them. You've got to coat that mucosa. Feed your septic patients and kind of go from there. Now, with all of that said, and all of it being thrown at you, and everybody's kind of going, okay, what do we do? There's some cool stuff that's come out. And it all started with this article by Manny Rivers that came out in 2001. In November 2001, Manny's article came out. I had the great pleasure of meeting Manny for the first time the summer of 2001 at an SCCM conference in New York City where he presented his data entirety at an SCCM conference before it ever hit the New England Journal. And it was fascinating just to hear, because this was the first time we'd ever heard any of this stuff. None of this stuff had ever come out. Nobody had ever talked about early goal-directed therapy. Nobody had ever talked about SCVO2. He hadn't heard about any of this stuff. This was the first time it ever came out. And here was this dude in shorts, flip-flops, and a Hawaiian button-up shirt, and standing in front of an entire SCCM audience giving this lecture. And I thought to myself, I want to meet that dude. And I did. And Manny and I are actually great friends right now. We've actually had the pleasure of giving multiple lectures together. He always likes to go first, so I always tease him he's my opening act. And, uh, but he's a lot of fun. He's a good guy. In this particular article, what they did was they ran it. It's a single center trial. And that's a big, big deal right here. Everybody does not like this part of it. And you know, if you've seen any of the stuff that's come out of UPMC, everybody slams this, this study because it came out of a single center. But they randomized patients that came in that had two surge criteria plus hypotension or had a lactate greater than four after they were quote unquote appropriately volume resuscitated. In the ED, and I'm sorry you can't see it too well, it says 1.4 hours. 1.4 hours. These weren't people that were put in a unit, watched for a day or two, 
They were seen in the ED. As soon as they, they met criteria, they were randomized and started within 1.4 hours. They were then put in either the EGDT group, where you can see everything they measured here, or the standard therapy arm there. They were then volume resuscitated as indicated. The first six hours, as you can see, folks that got EGDT got more fluid than the patients that were in the standard arm. Now, physicians were blinded to this. And at six hours, when they completed that, at hour seven, they went to the ICU. And the guys in the ICU did not know which arm the patients were in in the ED. And they took it from there. So at 72 hours, when the study completed, there was a total difference of 103 cc's across the board between the two groups. So when you look at it, you're like, well, you know, some folks got fluid early, some folks got fluid late. But, you know, they all got about the same amount of fluid. Until so you looked at their mortality. It was a 16% improvement in hospital mortality in patients that were in early goal-directed therapy. And if you looked at the 28-day and the 60-day, you saw significant improvements as well as time off mechanical ventilation, other organ dysfunctions, et cetera, from there. So based on that, everybody and their brother is like, oh, we are doing EGDT. Everybody did it. Everybody jumped on it. Everybody wanted to be a part of it, except for our ER colleagues because they just didn't want to put the catheter in and do it. So there was a lot of fight between ICU and ER, but everybody bought into it. But then back in, in 2006, the FACT trial came out. In the FACT trial, they said, well, you know what? Whoa, hold up on this EGDT stuff because we're not really buying into it very much. And the reason for that is they say, you know, like in these particular patients, they didn't do any better. What are you talking about? Because what they did was they initiated EGDT and volume resuscitation on an average of 43 hours after they got to the unit and 24 hours after they hit acute lung injury. And you're right, there was no difference in mortality between liberal and conservative management and fluids. But if you look at their organ function, conservative strategy actually worked better in that population. So you're like, oh, wait a minute. You've got this particular study saying we should give all this fluid as fast as we can. And then we've got this study saying, well, conservative works. The answer to it came out of this study right now out of Claire Murphy. In her study, what she looked at was, okay, I see what you're saying, and I see what you're saying. But this is a septic group. This is an acute lung injury group. She took them together. And Claire put acute lung injury patients due to septic shock, and she randomized them to four groups. And in the four groups, she looked at initial fluid resuscitation and then poster fluid management. 18% mortality in adequate early resuscitation with conservative post and 75% mortality for reversal. So the answer to your question is timing. When do you see the patient? If you see that patient early on, they're septic, they need aggressive fluid management. If you're seeing them later on and they've already got lung injury, well, then you need to be conservative. So the answer is timing. And whether should we measure intermittent or continuous, in this particular study from Smith and Chest, you're actually better off doing continuous because it's easier to monitor your patient and trying to do it intermittently from there. So based on that, everybody was like, OK, we're cool. We like EGDT. This is not a middle finger. It's a, it's a, it's a primary finger. So we're OK for, for, um, for conference from here. But then the process trial came out. And this, this trial really originated at UPMC. And these guys were just, you know, Fink and Angus and Pinsky and those guys, they were, just, they were hacked because the EGD trial that came out was a single center trial. So they did a multi-center trial across the US, and they randomized our patients into three groups. They did not regulate the type of fluid, whether they used crystalloid or colloid. They didn't regulate which vasopressors or antibiotic choices. And they randomized them into three groups, regular EGDT, regular standard therapy, which we just saw in the previous study, and then what they called usual care. Docs did whatever they wanted to do, usual care from there. And when you look at the characteristics of all three groups, they're all pretty much the same. However, when you look at the outcome, there's no statistical difference between outcome between the three groups. You look at mortality across the board, 90 days to a year. Statistically, there's no difference between the three groups. They took the same study, and they took it down to Australia, New Zealand, did the same study, same thing. Characteristics, EGDT versus usual care, equivalent, mortality, unchanged. Based on that, everybody 
their, their summation was early gold, early, gold, early gold record therapy doesn't work. Well, my answer to that is you're wrong. It does work. It works beautifully to the point that we don't see a difference in the two groups anymore. Why? Because when this study came out in 2001, we bought into it. And we adapted across the board as emergency medicine, critical care physicians, surgeons, etc. Everybody together, we adapted how we took care of our patients. So therefore, when you look at the three groups, there's no difference in outcome because there's really no difference in care. We're doing the same thing. We're giving fluid, we're giving antibiotics, we're giving vasopressors as they need to. We're checking lactate. We're doing all those things that Manny initiated in 1992. So you're not going to see a difference in outcome because we know what we're doing now. So that to me, although that to them proves EGTT is negative, to me it proves it's positive. He taught us so much critical care in those short years that we're all doing it right now. But looking at lactates, because let's face it, when you guys think of critical care medicine, you think lactate and you think Procal, right? I mean, that's what we, when, you call, when somebody calls us, what are, the, what are the two things we ask for? What's the lactate? What's the Procal? We do it all the time. Well, looking at lactate versus central venous oxygen saturation with early goal directed therapy, study compared our triggers between the two, comparing the two, which one's better. When you look at them, across the board, things are pretty equivalent whether you gave fluids, vasopressors, inotropes, et cetera, everything not, not statistically different per se. Everything goes across pretty well. When you look at mortality, though, it's better. Your mortality is better using lactate versus SCVO2, SCVO2 for resuscitation. We look at lactate itself, this group, this group by Piscarich and a friend of mine, Alan Hefner, looked at the rate of lactate clearance in your severe sepsis patients. And they looked at the original lactate with appropriate resuscitation, repeat lactate at six hours. And they found that those that normalized, survival was 93% versus 67% that didn't normalize. Those that cut it in half, 90 versus 68, only 10%, 78 versus 68. So by normalizing your lactate, you improve your survival. Why? Because you improve, you shift from anaerobic to aerobic metabolism in your mitochondria, your Krebs cycle kicks in, you're now making ATP, and your cells are going to survive. You're correcting it. Lactate therapy, taking a look at control group, this is just lactate for early goal directed therapy. Control group versus monitoring lactate from there. Again, you get more fluids, a little bit more red cells, just like you saw in early goal directed therapy with SCVO2 mortality using the lactate, almost 10% better. And it, it keeps going. When you take a look at it, your survival goes all the way out. They measured it out to 200 days. So to me, lactate's important. It's very important. That's why we measure it. In addition to that, when we look at acidosis, remember I said that we don't use bicarb. We don't give bicarb to our patients. When we look at our pH, 7.15 is our cutoff. Why? Because all of these things happen in the acidotic patient. They're hyporesponsive, catecholamines, they're arrhythmogenic, altered vasoconstriction, all those things happen. So measuring lactate, reversing your acidosis is extremely, extremely important from there. But there's some new stuff that's come out that's really kind of cool. And it's not everyday things. It's not like I'm going to walk up to you and say, hey, what's your combination arterial lactate levels and venous arterial CO2 to arterial venous O2 content difference marker? Probably not going to ask you that when you call me from the ER. But the cool thing about this is that they took a look and they said that so many of our patients that are actually measuring SVO2 or SCVO2 either have a normal or an elevated level. What does it mean? Are they fine? Are they perfusing beautifully? The answer is no, they're not. But what do we do with those normal levels? We also know that patients, when we measure MAP, when we measure heart rate, things such as that, normal hemodynamics, CVP, wedge, those don't tell us what our true perfusion is. And some of our oxy, oxygen metabolism don't tell us whether or not they have adequate tissue perfusion 
or whether or not that patient is going to progress to multi-organ dysfunction. So by looking at different differentias, such as this one up here, looking at that, could they predict hypoperfusion? So again, for completeness sake, I provide you nice little calculations here because most people don't have those off the top of their head. Some of, you, some of you are very smart and do. Some of you, when you sit down to take your boards, you write those out very quickly, along with how to calculate SVR and things such as that. So you have them written there. And they broke these guys down into four groups. And in group one, the lactate was elevated. And I'm just going to call it your content difference ratio, because that's a lot of letters to repeat. Your content ratio level was elevated. In group four, both of them were normalized. And groups two and three were a combination of those. Group two had an elevated lactate but normal content. Group three had a normal lactate elevated content. And when you look at it, your SOFA scores and everything come out pretty, pretty similar. But look at this. As the, these are elevated, your SOFA scores up. These are normal. Your SOFA scores are down. Look at your mortality difference. In group four, it, within six hours of resuscitating your patient, if you've normalized your lactate and normalized your content difference, this is your survival. In group one, where you have been unable to normalize your lactate or your content difference, this is your survival. And these two are a combination of the others. So just different way to take a look at perfusion and prediction of organ dysfunction from a simple calculation as well as measuring your lactate. Because if you look at your ROC curve, just measuring lactate by itself is pretty good. You add your content difference to it, and look at that. You improve your predictability. So easy ways to help predict how your patient is, whether your patient's actually perfusing, whether you need to do something else, or your patient's okay where they are right now. Again, looking at simple measurements that we don't think about. You know, We don't think about these calculations. But again, looking at your, your um, central venous to arterial CO2, difference combined with your oxygen difference. When you look at those, again, look down here. If those don't correct, they don't improve with your lactate, your hypoperfusion is not resolved, and you still need to resuscitate your patient. So based on that, just something different that we don't think about, but new stuff that's coming out all the time. I, put, I added this for my trauma colleagues. I thought you guys would find this cute. So. What about PCT? We use ProCal all the time. The biggest trial that's come out to date is the Parada trial. Parada trial took a look at patients when they came in, they were febrile, they had a white count. Were they infected? They measured their ProCal. If a ProCal was low, they didn't think they needed antibiotics. As you started going up, eh, still discouraged. Ah, oh, getting higher, we're going to give some antibiotics. High, strongly encouraged. If it was negative initially, but you really felt that patient was, was septic, they could repeat the level 6 to 12 hours and then, again, put them in their protocol. After appropriate treatment, they started, and the white count was coming down, fever curve coming down, patients, hemodynamic issues resolving. From there, they started rechecking procals. And once the concentration started dropping, stop the antibiotics. Stop the antibiotics. Continue the antibiotics. Just putting them in that particular protocol. And what they found, again, just there was no difference there's no difference in mortality. Everybody's like, oh, man, we're doing all this, and there's no difference in mortality. What you did see is this. You had a three-day difference in antibiotics. You decrease your antibiotic usage, you get your patients in and out of the hospital faster. So there's no difference in mortality, but there's a different statistical difference in antibiotic days. That's a big deal. It's cost-saving. It helps your patients. All those things come to play. So... Less antibody exposure in the control group, pro-cal group, much improved. No difference in mortality, decrease in length of stay. Where can we use this? Best place in the world for this is actually the emergency department and the ICU. And it shows that as your pro-cal goes up, your, your likelihood of treatment failure goes up as well if you don't recognize the level of illness of your particular patient. Red cells. Who do we transfuse? When do we transfuse? How do we transfuse? This particular study I really like because it's, it's, I call it the two-hit theory of injury. Should we transfuse everybody? Absolutely not. Why? Because blood has bioactive particles and they cause 
damage to the organs. In addition to that, as the cells age, they start deforming. We already have problems with thrombosis in our microcirculature. If you add older cells, you have more deforming, more thrombosis, more hypoperfusion. And the question also comes in, when should we transfuse? Should we transfuse them right off the bat, or should we wait? So there's a lot of questions related to transfusion. I don't have the answers to all that, but it's questions that have come up. I can tell you this much, if you have a septic patient, and I apologize, this doesn't really pop up very well, but this is nice young blood. You can see the red cells are not deformed, they're flowing nicely. By 21 days, you start to see a lot of deformability, and by day 35, look at this. If you have a septic patient that you want to transfuse to improve perfusion and improve your oxydynamics, call your blood bank, ask them for the youngest blood that they have. They know what that means. They've worked with us long enough. They know to give you blood that is less than 21 days old. They will give you the youngest blood that they have if you call and ask them. Otherwise, you get the blood that's 41 days old that's going to expire in six hours. You know, if you had a trauma patient, you've got a GI bleed, you've got something like that, that you're not worried about the age of the blood, well then yes, use the oldest blood first. Septic patients, always call the lab and ask them for the youngest blood. Therefore, you don't have the deformability and the bile particles in there, and it's not going to cause further problems for you. Now, who do we transfuse? That question comes in all the time. We took a look at the initial TRIC trial that came out in 1999, where in ARDS patients, they randomized between high and low hemoglobins. In this particular study, by holsting them, lower, they did not transfuse unless the hemoglobin was seven or less. Higher, they transfused to maintain a hemoglobin of nine or greater. And what they found was that there was no difference between the two groups, none whatsoever. So what you can ascertain from that is that you don't have to maintain that hemoglobin of 10, that hematocrit of 30. If there's no difference in outcome, seven or greater is fine. There is no transfusion trigger from that particular standpoint. This I include just for fun because for those of us that work in the emergency department, it's kind of cool to see what can we use to predict mortality from sepsis in the ED. And this is the, the mortality emergency department uh, sepsis score. As you can see, everything gets a number. And the higher your number, the higher your likelihood of mortality. And if you look at your ROC, your med score actually is pretty accurate from there. They did not measure lactate in most of their patients, so it's not overly helpful. And CRP eh, fell a little bit above the 50-50 line. I would have been very interested to see combining the med score and the lactate as to where that would, what they have told us from that particular standpoint. So... Some new stuff that's on the horizon that you're going to start seeing here. At some point, we're going to start using thrombolestography using TEGS. TEGS are able to tell us different profiles when it comes to fibrinolysis and anticoagulation in our patients. And the more fibrinolytic and the more coagulopathic our patients are, the more we're going to be able to tell mortality and bleeding in these particular septic patients per se. And last but not least, TPE. You see us do it all the time. This is the largest study that's, that's come out in the last 10 years on 23 patients using TPE in the septic shock patient. And what we found is that in people that are survivors, you will see a significant decrease in their vasopressor usage very quickly, usually within 24 to 48 hours, usually after the first or second treatments. And also what's really important here is look at your platelet count. Usually after the first or second treatment, your platelet count will jump immensely in your survivors. Quick summation of the differences that we're seeing in the last eight years or so using the surviving sepsis criteria and guidelines. Lactate is now a 1A, makes me very happy. PCT is not there yet, but you're starting to see it. You saw it in 2012 on their list. You saw it in 2013 in the Angus study. Do not transfuse unless you need to for oxydynamics and perfusion. Hemoglobin's greater than 7. And from there, this is just a great summation um, slide that I just throw in there for anybody that wants it, just for future reference. And with that, you guys know how I feel about minions. If anybody's got any questions, I will be more than glad to answer them. And I can't believe I got that done in 55 minutes. <laughs> Thank you.
the very well put together review, and I think you know if, if, if there's one thing that I, is worthy of summation, um, without getting into what a Bonferroni correction is, it's the essence of what we accept typically in our scientific literature is significant is uh, about a, a chance that five percent of the time it's a mistake. And so, as you read the literature, if you read 20 articles, according to that premise, one of them is just going to be flat out wrong. It's just, going to be, it's just not going to be right. And the number of times, as you look at the surviving sepsis guidelines, something was, it was strongly recommended, uh, uh, and then it's been pulled from the market, is legend. I mean, it, the, the number was, it's staggering how many things have been, you have to do this, and now, oh, it turns out, example, giving estrogen replacement therapy, if you didn't do that in 1989 and somebody broke their hip, that's malpractice. Now you do it, they get breast cancer, it's malpractice if you do do it. So, I think the I point, I think um, Dr. Greer made it well, is, Read, read, the, in, read the literature carefully and be flexible. Re recognize anybody that's truly dogmatic. Who's the target to? It's probably that person. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that, that's something too. It's like um, there's so many things out there that if you just read the abstract, it says this. But if you go back through, I mean, what, what I always preach is read the abstract and see if you're interested in the article. And then read the article. Don't change how you practice medicine until you really, really in really in depth. I mean, if you look at the SAFE trial when it comes to looking for Sploit versus Coloid, you know, the SAFE trial will tell you that there's no difference between the two. And across the board, there isn't. However, if you look at the hypoalbuminemic patients that you actually pull out of the subsegment, they actually do better with Coloid than Crystalloid. But you've got to, but if you didn't read the entire article, you'd never know that. So I agree with John completely in that read the abstract, see if you're interested in it, read the article to figure out what's going on. And don't just jump on whatever's come out. Make sure you, you actually have an understanding because so much stuff, especially in sepsis, I mean, I can't tell you how many silver bullets that we thought we had and they don't even survive the phase three trials. So sepsis is a tough one. It's continually changing and that's why we call it the practice of medicine as opposed to something else. I think the surviving sepsis guidelines are, are good for that. But recognize that at the beginning of the surviving sepsis guidelines, there's there's a page and a half of number four font for all of the corporate sponsors, and they all have a dog in the fight. So don't read surviving sepsis guidelines and then go practice. Read surviving sepsis guidelines and find out what their source literature was. Read that and then use that to practice. Yeah. Because just be cautious. Be cautious. Because, uh, well, I think Lori did a great job. Thank you. You all have a great day. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Herbert. <laughs> I listened closely, and I was very interested when you mentioned nutrition. Yes, sir. And it worries me that, um, that we may be um, not looking closely enough at, at nutrition. Uh, you mentioned the lactic acid, uh, um, last I recall, lactic acid dehydrogenase uh, functions best with, with a magnesium. Uh, ion uh, with it, or, and um, with the um, catecholamines, um, tyrosine hydroxylase, which has a hydroxyl group on to tyrosine, and then another hydroxyl group for dopamine and, and other changes to norepinephrine. And, and, and that's a, that's a um, um, zinc requiring uh, mm -hmm. metalloenzyme. And I heard you mention uh, or refer to intravenous selenium. Uh, I don't know what selenium does. I don't know that anyone does. I don't think anybody does. But uh, we do know what certain um, micronutrients and, and uh, metals do. And uh, in, the, in the rush to save a person's life, uh, do, we, do we pay attention to those things and, and check those things as closely as you think they should be? We usually do. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of literature, especially on zinc in um, the critically ill. And it's, it's still out there, whether or not, you know, and I know when we write TPN, which we do very, very infrequently, 
it's, it's one of those micro elements that we give. But across the board, we found that there's no improvement in survival by adding extra zinc to our enteral nutrition. But we're very, um, in our, my ICU, in our ICU, we're very aggressive in feeding people. I mean, if, if, they've, if they've got a tube and they've got a stomach and there's not a contraindication, we feed them. We feed them as fast as possible because otherwise you're going to have contra complications from, from that. So I agree completely with you, sir. And the history for surgeons is we've, we've fallen behind or had fallen behind in terms of being too slow to feed patients. Immediate post-operative surgical patients that have had abdominal operations be getting fed and enterally as opposed to when I was starting out, everybody had a big yellow bag with yeah. TPN in it. And the, the reality is no, the enteral formulas um, are good and you can use them, use them early. And, um, and even in the face of anastomosis, if, if we're, we need to feed the patient, that is very, very important. To use them and I think that was well pointed out. Okay. Well, over which we will not start enteral nutrition mm -hmm. on lactic acid level. Is, do you wait for the lactic acid level to be less than four or less than two, or do you not look at it? I typically will not initiate enteral feeds until I feel that my patient is volume resuscitated appropriately. Um, I don't necessarily look at lactate for that, start feedings. I'd like to see my lactate improve and normalize, but there's other reasons for elevated lactate. And, you know, patients that have a persistent lactate, even after you volume resuscitate them, and you move on to some norad some vasopressin, steroids, and we start TPE. We still feed those people. But I would, you know, somebody who's just fresh rolling in, got a lactate of 12, I would like to get them volume resuscitated as I initiate. But once they're properly volume resuscitated, we do start feeds. We don't worry about vasopressors, TPE, stuff like that. I, I like them to be volume resuscitated, and then we start. And then we try to do that as quickly as possible. LDH level in someone who has uh, uh, elevated lactate from hypoperfusion. You know, I'll be honest with you, Dr. Embry. I don't know. I don't measure it. I really don't know. It'd be interesting to know, but we don't we don't typically measure LDHs anymore. My, my last comment. No, no. No, no, no. Everybody should realize that this lady is a graduate of this school. Beat your beat your chest after having her.